Hello, everybody, and welcome to the latest instalment of At Risk International's Global Risk Intelligence Team Weekly Briefing. Today, we can't ignore the conflict in Ukraine. Um, it's into its fifth day, seeing fighting in multiple locations, uh, but the heaviest is around Kharkiv, the second city, and Kiev, uh, where Russian forces are around. 30 kilometers from the capital, uh, although Russia's not actually been able to take any of those cities. Uh, Ukraine putting up some pretty uh, staunch defense, uh, so much so that actually the Russians have for the first time acknowledged that they've been taking some casualties, difficult to verify any numbers, uh, but Ukraine's saying um, over 4,000 fatalities on the Russian side. Um, that's really slowed the Russian advance down along with some um, logistical failures um, that they keep having. Um, we're also seeing civilian cost to Ukraine increasing, uh, a number of civilians killed in the conflict, um, several hundred thousand refugees uh, heading for neighbouring countries. And the latest estimates we're seeing um, are around one to three million people may look to leave Ukraine, up to five million could become displaced in total uh, if the fighting becomes protracted. Uh, we did have some negotiations today, uh, no significant progress anticipated, uh, Ukraine looking for an immediate ceasefire um, and Russia saying it's looking for a deal that suits everybody uh, but without actually giving any specifics. America actually advised Ukraine to be wary of uh, Russian diplomatic moves. Uh, wider response to the conflict, uh, EU uh, for the first time, deciding to send uh, military equipment to Ukraine um, alongside a growing number of countries, uh, most crucially Germany, actually, which has hardened its, hardened its stance against Russia significantly uh, since the conflict began. And really what we're seeing is a lot of moves to isolate Russia from the international system, uh, isolating them from uh, the SWIFT uh, banking system um, so they can't maintain any international transfers, which is going to limit their ability to access their overseas reserves. Uh, Russia does have large foreign currency reserves, but a lot of that is actually held in foreign currencies, the dollar, the euro, uh, sterling, uh, as well as in gold. Um, so a Western ban on, on dealing with Russia's central bank uh, is going to restrict uh, Russia's access to that money uh, and then you know hurt their ability to fund uh, the conflict uh, and also um, to uh, fund their economy. Based on the sanctions being introduced against Russia, uh, the ruble fell about 30-40% today, uh, so it's now historic low against the dollar. And then seeing a lot of uh, pictures of, of Russians domestically trying to withdraw their money from their accounts and close their bank accounts. Uh, the Russian central bank uh, actually doubled the interest rates to try and stabilise the economy. Uh, but if it carries on like it is, then it looks like capital controls will be increasingly likely. So limiting the cash that people can actually withdraw, uh, and that's going to be pretty unpopular domestically. Uh, also seeing uh, businesses take action. So oil company BP getting rid of its 20% stake in Rosneft, the Russian state-backed oil company, uh, and Norway Sovereign Wealth Fund, uh, also divesting from its Russian holdings. Um, also, we're seeing the EU and Canada um, close their airspace to Russian aircraft, America considering similar intervention. Uh, Russia responded by uh, banning uh, flights from about 36 countries that I last saw, um, so hampering international travel quite significantly. And then lastly, uh, it's been reported that Turkey may actually block Russian warships from entering the Black Sea through the Bosphorus. Um, that would be a pretty significant strategic blow to Russia's navy. Uh, Russia's responded to all of this by ordering its nuclear forces to be put on special alert. Uh, that's the highest level of readiness that they have, um, saying that it was in response to aggressive NATO statements. Um, but really, in the absence of a ceasefire, the most concerning thing is that Russia is going to escalate the conflict. Um, it's likely to deploy more troops to Ukraine uh, and carry out more indiscriminate shelling or missile attacks on major cities. Uh, there's actually some reporting suggesting that that's already happening in, in Kharkiv. Um, also seeing reports that Belarus is preparing to join the conflict. Uh, the Belarusian government 
um, started making statements like Ukraine uh, carrying out provocative actions um, and about NATO aggression and really kind of setting those conditions to justify uh, a Belarusian offensive. Um, then in terms of responding uh, to the West, there's obviously an increased concern uh, in cyber activity or cyber attacks from Russia. And on the call with me, I have one of our analysts, Cooper McGill, who's going to take us through um, the cyber threats. Hey, thank you, Ross. Uh, so firstly, last week, uh, kind of prior to this Russian military action, CISA had issued a warning uh, here in the United States to critical infrastructure organizations on the risk of uh, foreign influence operations, uh, cyber espionage campaigns, uh, as things, you know, really began to escalate uh, between Russia and Ukraine. Uh, it's become clear that uh, threat actors in Russia have the ability to quickly and quite effectively employ foreign influence operations um, and various cyber campaigns. Uh, and, you know, the risk is that the targeting could become more severe if escalation continues. Uh, you know, so it was and still is important for, uh, you know, individuals involved in critical infrastructure organizations, uh, critical infrastructure organizations themselves to make sure they're evaluating their individual individual risk, you know, securing accounts, secure comms, uh, even for individuals limiting social media footprint. Uh, and now, you know, moving here to today, post invasion, you know, things are uh, have become a little bit more specific, uh, but are obviously evolving, changing frequently. But U.S. banks at the moment and financial institutions in general uh, are on pretty high alert, looking out for uh, retaliatory cyber attacks from Russia. Uh, as Ross had mentioned, you know, there's been a number of sanctions that have been put in place by the United States as well as the European Union uh, that are starting to and will probably continue to take a pretty serious economic toll on Russia. Uh, so it's thought that, uh, you know, U.S. banks and fi financial institutions could be a pretty prime uh, retaliatory target for them. Uh, so, you know, right now they're preparing along with other critical infrastructure orgs, uh, but for you know, ransomware attacks, uh, you know, malware, DDoS type attacks, uh, data data collection, th data theft, uh, stealing sensitive information, uh, really a whole wide range of uh, tactics that Russia has at its disposal. There have been still no specific threats against particular, you know, banks or institutions, individuals, organizations. Um, but everyone is, you know, no question on very high alert right now and preparing for, uh, you know, that potential uh, type of attack to occur. Uh, and, you know, it should be noted, too, that, you know, what's been frequently used in the past by by Russia as a, you know, a tactic of theirs is, you know, employing the abundance of, you know, ransomware gangs and other types of, you know, cybercrime groups that are operating within Russia currently, uh, you know, either directing them towards specific targets, directing them to general, you know, sectors, you know, defense contractors, that type of thing, uh, and utilizing them to conduct, you know, a ransomware attacks or deploying malware. Uh, so then when those attacks are traced back, you know, to a ransomware group in Russia specifically, you know, they have the ability to, you know, deny direct involvement, you know, it, hey, you know, this wasn't uh, direct action on behalf of, you know, Russia by like the you know, GRU cyber espionage group or something along those lines. Um, but that'll be something to keep an eye on. And there's no question everyone is on high alert right now. And it's things, you know, look like they're going to continue to possibly escalate, um, there will be uh, a lot of updates in this space, no question about that. And that's what I've got for you. That's good, we appreciate it. Uh, so although uh, the Ukraine conflict is obviously the most critical and immediate 
um, risk uh, that we have going on at the moment. One of the other things we've been uh, tracking uh, for some time is, is uh, climate change, and in particular, the IPCC reports on climate change. They released their latest one today, 28th of February, uh, really about the human impacts of climate change. Uh, and the report found that human-induced climate change uh, has, called, has caused widespread adverse impacts, and that's actually beyond what we'd expect to see with natural climate variability. So really kind of, again, stating the, the, the human impact now is, is kind of becoming undeniable. And, and some of those impacts that we're seeing are already irreversible. The report's also saying there's approximately, the report's also saying that there's over 3 billion people living in locations that are highly vulnerable to climate change. And that actually it's near-term mitigation is, that's key. Uh, near term in this context seems to be around about the next 10 years or so. And it's about keeping global warming from reaching 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, if it does reach that level, and most analysis you read says that not enough is being done to stop it reaching that level, there's going to be unavoidable increases in multiple climate hazards. And depending on how much you go over that 1.5 degrees, some of the damage that will be caused will be irreversible, even if global warming is reduced. So the main risks you know, we're going to see are that multiple climate hazards will occur simultaneous, simultaneously. Uh, across different regions and actually you know what you might see is lots of climate and then non-climate risks kind of overlapping resulting in kind of like a compound risk so the real kind of issue is that we might actually see multiple climate hazards occurring simultaneously so climate and non-climate type risks kind of interacting together. So, you know, sort of dual risks of, say, like conflict and climate uh, causing significant issues across lots of different sectors and lots of different regions. But when you look at kind of what the risks might be to businesses, for example, so definitely we're looking at kind of e increasing risk of radical environmentalism in the coming years. Um, so lots of protests and civil disobedient campaigns that we see already, they're likely to increase definitely, you know, in the next 12 months and onwards. Uh, also increased risk of ecotage or ecological sabotage. So damage to property of businesses that are considered to be heavily polluting or, or releasing a lot of emissions. Um, and indeed some of those that, you know, finance things like fossil fuel uh, projects. Uh, and then kind of the final risk is actual, you know, actual eco-terrorism. So kind of targeted attacks against individuals and politicians um, and maybe kind of business leaders, um, you know, as some individuals start to see climate change as that existential threat um, that, that really is grounded in, in you know, actual scientific data, um, then, then definitely increasing risk of uh, eco-terrorism from that. Uh, and that's it for uh, this week's briefing. We hope you found the information uh, useful.